rational scientists. Um, today I wanted to make a video explaining why an atom is an indivisible fundamental object and why an atom's shape must relate to its properties. Any theory that involves an atom must ultimately relate the architecture of the atom to its behavior. And also, any theory that proposes that matter can be divided infinitely and that the universe is some type of mathematical fractal that is infinitely divisible, infinitely um, magnifiable, I guess. You can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and never find a smallest part. Um, that whole idea is an irrational religion, and in this video I'm going to explain why. You see, it all started with Democritus, the father of atomic theory. And he had a simple thought experiment. He said that if you divide a loaf of bread over and over ad infinitum, you will eventually come to a single piece that cannot be broken down any further. A fundamental object. He called this the atom. But why can't the atom be broken down further? And why can't those pieces get broken down ad infinitum, to infinity, unlimited? Well, nobody seems to have any respect for the basic rationality behind Democritus' model. If we really explored the line of reasoning behind this, we would see that Democritus' atom is more scientific than any of the models proposed by the mathematical establishment, including quantum mechanics. The line of reasoning is really quite simple. We start by defining the term object. An object is that which has shape. All existing objects are finite pursuant to this definition. The loaf of bread has a shape, which is bound by space, or some other background. Since all objects are finite, it is impossible to imagine an infinite amount of things comprising a finite thing. Such a suggestion is clearly absurd. How could you fit an unlimited amount of things inside of a single finite object? You see, no object can be infinite because objects are bounded and have a shape by definition. It is a contradiction to propose a boundless object. Still following this line of reasoning, it's clear that individual atoms then must have shape. If the loaf of bread is comprised of atoms, and the loaf of bread itself has shape, then whatever is comprising that bread must also have shape, no matter how small the pieces are. It also stands to reason that the properties of an atom must follow from their shape, since shape is the only intrinsic property to all objects, and this is the ultimate key to understanding physics. Democritus also reasoned this. For example, Democritus hypothesized that iron atoms had little hooks which allowed them to bond so strongly, or that salt atoms are spiky because he thought that they tasted sharp. In other words, he used their physical shapes as an explanation for why they had certain properties and qualities and actions. This is the essence of physics. Now these might seem a little bit like the ramblings of an ancient fool to the abstract modern mathematical thinker, but we need to understand that Democritus' assumptions were far more rational than any of the quantum models being proposed today simply by virtue of the fact that Democritus used physical architecture to explain the properties of these objects, which is something that modern mathematicians don't even attempt anymore. The modern abstract mathematician will tell you that 
abstract rules and mathematical laws govern the universe. But we need to remember that it's really objects that cause behavior. It is architecture, structure, and physical things that cause behavior. For example, what physically extends from the atoms comprising Earth to the atoms comprising the Sun and pulls them together? This is the ultimate question of gravity, and mathematicians have given up altogether on trying to figure out what the real architecture responsible for gravity is. Even the father of quantum physics himself, Niels Bohr, admitted that quantum physics is not even a genuine attempt at trying to understand reality. Yet today, more and more people believe that the irrational models of quantum are actual representations of reality, and that nature itself is not rational. So what are we really seeing under these atomic touch microscopes, or inside of these atom smashers? Well, Bill Gady has an idea, and it actually explains gravity, light, magnetism, and electricity, all in one model. Check it out. Consistent with the Schrodinger born cloud, the electron is a balloon that encapsulates the atom. Up close, the electron looks like a ball of yarn. The proton is a tiny dandelion with its quill stretching out like a sea urchin. The electron and the proton merge to give us the hydrogen atom, the most common element in the universe. Recall that under the rope hypothesis, the electromagnetic ropes from every atom in the universe converge upon our tiny atom. The incoming electric and magnetic threads of a given rope fork out at the perimeter of the atom. Consistent with the Broglie's hypothesis, the magnetic threads curl around and form a wavy surface. The electric thread continues straight towards the center of the atom. This architecture explains why the electron does not spiral into the nucleus. It also justifies quantum jump. Consistent with Bohr's theory, when the electron expands, it can do so only at the expense of the electromagnetic rope, which it instantly torques. Conversely, when the electron balloon contracts, it releases a link of electromagnetic rope while also sending a signal. We call the aggregate of links released and absorbed energy. The physical interpretation of C squared in Einstein's famous equation is that an atom sends electromagnetic signals to every atom and every atom sends signals to it via electromagnetic ropes. We refer to the aggregate of friction generated at each point around the electron balloon as charge. So now, let's compare the thread version of the atom against the irrational and inconsistent versions proposed by quantum. On the one hand, the mathematicians would have you believe that an atom is comprised of discrete beads that orbit the nucleus. On the other, they treat the orbits of the electron beads as balloons. The mathematicians need the bead model of the electron to explain ionization and electric current. They need the balloon model to explain how two atoms physically bind to form a molecule. The mathematicians have in effect blended the orbiting bead and the cloud into a single model in order to cover all the bases. They have thus rendered quantum theory unfalsifiable. To make their model even less credible, the mathematicians have the negative electron bead going through the center of the positive nucleus and out the other end in figure 8p orbitals. Those mathematicians who realize the implications try to con you by stopping the electron at the doorsteps of the proton, but neither group can justify either behavior. Therefore, the merged particle and balloon models proposed by quantum guarantees that you will never have a chance to win an argument against a quantum mathematician. 
On the other hand, the balloon version of the electron enables us to treat the atom in the same way it is treated daily by chemists. We are looking at what is plainly there, a skin. The skin of an atom is a surface weaved by gazillions of threads. This model enables us to visualize how two atoms bind with each other and form a molecule. The orbitals that the chemists illustrate in no way can be confused with orbits of electron beads. The picture of two colliding gold atoms presented by the Brookhaven accelerator shows that atoms are the convergence of threads from every atom in the universe. It does not show that we are staring at traces of particles. Likewise, the illustrations and descriptions of hybridized atomic orbitals, as well as pictures of smooth-skinned atoms, can never be confused for particle orbitals. The particle model of quantum has no scientific basis whatsoever and is in direct violation of what is plainly in front of us. The claim of particle physicists that they accelerate particles is fundamentally flawed. So, now you know Bill Gates' model of the atom. Is it right? That's up to you to decide. But we know for sure that quantum is wrong. Because any time that you propose that an object exists, that object must have shape and location. And any behavior allegedly performed by the object must be mediated by the physical structure of that object. That's the ultimate essence of physics. The shape must relate to its behavior, and vice versa. So, thank you for watching. I hope that you found this enjoyable. Um, please come and join the Rational Scientific Method group on Facebook, and uh, take part in the discussion there. Thank you very much. Have a good one.